today's lecture is organizing life's diversity. Your learning targets. Be able to summarize the basic history of classification. Be able to explain what a scientific name is. Be able to explain why having a scientific name is important. Describe the organization of taxa in a biological classification system. Describe how evolutionary relationships are determined. And lastly, be able to compare and contrast the three domains of life. Let's take a look at this organism. Upon first glance, you would probably classify this as a, go ahead, fill in the blank. Most of us are going to say snake, right? But there's a problem. This is not a snake. Well, how is this not a snake? Well, we have to dive deeper. We've got to look at the physical characteristics of this animal to determine exactly what it is if it's not a snake. So the first thing we could look at, and if we were able to take a close look at it, is that this doesn't have a fused eyelid. This animal will actually blink regularly throughout its day, and it will sleep with its eyes closed. Whereas a snake has a fused eyelid, and it sleeps even without being able to close its eyes. So that fused eyelid makes it look like it's sleeping with its eyes wide open. Secondly, this animal does not have a highly mobile jaw. We know with snakes, they unhinge their jaws, they can take in larger prey, but this cannot. This one cannot do that with its jaw, and it must eat smaller things compared to that of a snake. And lastly, this animal does not have a short tail posterior to its anus. What does that mean? Well, it means it has a long tail posterior to its anus. Why does it have that? Well, this animal, when it's threatened, can actually drop its tail. It can actually consciously control its tail coming off and wriggling around while it escapes and whatever's after it might settle for a smaller snack and grab the tail that's not moving as fast. This is not a snake. This is what we call a legless lizard. Using the example from the last slide, what we want to be able to do in biology is organize life's diversity. There is an incredible amount of diversity on planet Earth of all the animals. We want to be able to put them in groups so we understand them better. So we're going to base this on the idea of classification, the grouping of objects or information based on similarities as we look at different organisms. So we're looking for common things that we see in different groups of animals. It allows us to put them together in a group. We call this discipline taxonomy. It's the branch of biology that essentially that groups and names organisms based on studies of their physical characteristics. The word taxonomy can be broken into two parts from Latin. Taxa or taxa means to arrange and nami means to order knowledge. So ultimately we're trying to arrange ordered knowledge about groups of animals. What is believed to be the first time that individuals tried to classify things dates all the way back to the Greek philosophers where we had Aristotle try to essentially come up with a system where he could categorize things around us in the natural world. So the first way that is reported that he did that is just by dividing things into living things into plants and animals. Later on there were some um, additional ideas of humans being kind of an outgroup and rocks being an outgroup um, that didn't quite make the cut into the animals or plants. But he wound up subdividing the animals and plants into essentially smaller categories. So plants, he could look at them and put them in a group if they were small, if they were medium, or if they were large. Um, trees, shrubs, and grasses kind of fit that profile. And then on animals, he kind of went three different directions with that. Land animals, terrestrials, aquatic animals, animals that lived in water, and air animals, animals that flew. But unfortunately, what this did was it categorized animals that were very sim uh, dissimilar to each other. For example, if we were to talk about a bat, a bird, and a butterfly, we know that they all fly. But to put them all in the same little group tells us nothing about their evolutionary history, how they made it together. And in fact, those three animals are very far apart when we go ahead and put them into actual groups of today. So ultimately what we want to know is we want to know how these organisms came to be in these groups that we put them in and that evolutionary history where we track the earliest known ancestor to what we have today is what we call an organism's phylogeny. If we fast forward almost 1500 years, 
from the Greek philosophers' ideas on classification. We get to what we call today the binomial system of classification, the binomial system of taxonomy. There was a man named Carolus Linnaeus who lived in the 1700s, who ultimately was the first one to come up with this binomial system of nomenclature. Binomial means essentially a two-part name. The first part of that name is what we call the genus, and the second part of that name is what we call the specific epithet. And that refers to one species of potentially many within a genus. So ultimately, a genus is a group of organisms that have a lot of similar characteristics, whereas the specific epithet narrows out one particular individual from that bigger group. So if we talk about a scientific name of a species, or if we were just broadly using the term species, we refer to it by its full binomial name, such as genus first, specific epithet second. So that's your two-part name. So again, genus and species, what do they actually specify? The genus represents a group of organisms that share many common characteristics. A species is a group of organisms with the highest level of shared characteristics, and most importantly, as we've learned earlier, can successfully interbreed with one another. So down at the bottom of this slide, you see three different, we'll call them big cats, okay? These three big cats all look fairly similar. They're all quadrupeds, they all have smallish faces, they all have whiskers, they have large canine teeth, and the list goes on and on. But if we take a look and we apply this idea of a binomial system, we have to wonder first, are these three big cats in the same genus? Now, the first one here is called Lynx rufus. This is the name that we give to a bobcat. The second organism, this one's called Lynx canadensis, and this is the name we actually give to commonly known, what's commonly known as a lynx. And then the third one is called Felis concolor, and this is a mountain lion. Now, these three clearly do not have the same genus as one another. Down on the left, we see Lynx rufus and Lynx canadensis have the same genus, the first word in the two-part name. But then the specific epithet, rufus and canadensis, differ from each other. Now, you'll notice the mountain lion has a different genus name. It's called Felis. Now, what this means is that it's in a completely different genus than these two here. They are related, but we're going to say it's a different genus because of a particular physical attribute. Both the bobcat and the lynx have 28 teeth. However, despite all the shared characteristics, the mountain lion has 30. And that 30 earns it a different genus. And it's very likely that there is limited reproduction between Felis concolor, the mountain lion, and the bobcat and the lynx. So how do we go about writing the scientific name of an organism? Well, again, we need to make sure that we know its genus and its specific epithet, so the genus name and the species name. And how we're going to write it is we're going to capitalize the genus name, and we're going to leave the first letter of the species name or specific epithet in lower case. Also, we're going to italicize both, and we're going to underline both. Now, if you're doing a report on a particular animal, what you're going to do is you're going to initially name your animal in the report following those two important rules. And then every time you mention it after, we're just going to use the capital letter of the genus. Um, in the case of uh, Homo sapiens, if we've mentioned it already, we can just put capital letter H dot and then the word sapiens would be lowercase, again, italicized and underlined if we mentioned it previously. So we've mentioned the genus and the species names, and we know that that's how we kind of pinpoint a particular organism to an identity. But that's not all there is in the levels of taxonomy. It goes bigger than that. As you know, these animals that we're essentially trying to figure out what they are, they're part of bigger groups. So if we talk about the genus species of, let's say this right here, this is a wolf. We're going to say its genus name is Canis, and its species name is Lupus. Now, Canis Lupus is part of a bigger group of dog-like animals that we call Canidae. So Canidae is part of what we call a family. So the dog-like family of organisms are called Canidae. Now, this particular group of dog-like organisms is nested in a group above it 
called an order, carnivora. So these animals are essentially meat eaters. And that class of mammalia are animals that ultimately provide nourishment for their young through a placenta. That's what mammals do. Now, mammals are part of a bigger group called phylum chordata. And these are uh, what we call chordates. These are animals that have essentially a uh, nerve tube that runs down their dorsum or their backside, um, which typically connects to a brain. The phylum chordata is part of a bigger kingdom called animalia, which is multicellular organisms. And the kingdom animalia is part of a bigger group called the domain eukarya, which ultimately all the members of this domain have the same type of cells. So we have this bigger picture of taxonomy from the smallest increment of species, which pinpoints in on a particular type of animal all the way to domain, which contains all of the organisms that are made of eukaryotic cells. Each smaller level is nested in a larger level that sits above it. And all of these levels are referred to as taxa. These are groups of organisms that exhibit a shared set of traits. So as you work up, these taxa are going to get a little bit broader and have more characteristics that are shared amongst different groups. So in the kingdom Animalia, think of all the animals that you could possibly put under this umbrella term, and we know that there would be a lot of groups underneath that. And as you work yourself down, you get more and more specific towards that animal of choice. Now, how would a student remember domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species? Is there any way to help us do that? Well, good thing, answer is yes. We have what are known as mnemonic devices. These are mental phrases to remember lists and parts as we're trying to come up with names. Um, here's, for example, a pretty goofy sentence, but um, it has some meaning to it as we talk about taxonomy. Drunken kangaroos punch children on family game shows. Sounds kind of weird. How about didn't know Popeye's chicken offered free gizzard strips? Or my favorite, darn kids playing chess on freeways get squished. So what are these ridiculous sentences? Well, if you look at these sentences, look at the first letter of each word of those sentences, and then look at the taxonomy above it. D, K, P, C, O, F, G, S. Those particular letters sit in front of the words from the taxonomic levels from biggest to smallest. So if I'm looking at this bottom sentence, darn kids playing chess on freeways get squished, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Hope it helps. So this animal here, this is a leopard. And what we can do is we can kind of trace the taxa that it belongs to um, from the very specific all the way to the general or vice versa. So for this one, let's go ahead and we'll start at the bottom. Um, this one's domain. Notice that that order of D, K, P, C, O, F, G, S goes upward in this one. And what we would do is we would, first of all, try to link it to one of these domains. Is a leopard a bacteria? Um, the answer would be, of course, no. Archaea is another branch of bacteria that came a little bit later that live in real inhospitable conditions on planet Earth. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to narrow it down to eukarya because it's made of eukaryotic cells. Now, the next step up, we know that we can put it into a smaller group of kingdom animalia. Now, why are there these other blue squares here? Well, there's other kingdoms that are now present um, that, an, a, that a particular eukaryote could fit into. Um, for example, there's fungi and there's also plantae. Now you'll notice that this has five. We've actually changed the knowledge on there being five kingdoms and now we're down to three. So we have animalia, we have fungi, and we have plantae. So this one is clearly gonna be an animal. It's not a fungus and it's not a plant. It's going to be a chordate, a particular type of animal that has that uh, dorsal nerve cord along its back. Uh, it's in the class mammals. So this is a placental animal. It's in the order Carnivora, which means a meat eater. The family is Felidae, cat-like species. The genus is Panthera, 
And Panthera, as you can see, has four species as part of it. This one is Pardus, so this is a Panthera Pardus. You could also do an exercise that relates to these nested levels of taxa by looking at your global address. Now, what does that mean? Well, think of ex your global address as where you live every single day and how it's part of a much bigger system. So what zeroes in on where I live is my street address. I have a set of numbers that pinpoints exactly which house mine is on a particular street. That street is the next biggest level because there's a number of houses on that street. But that street is part of a bigger system called a city or a township or a village. And we know there's lots of streets in that bigger entity of that city, village, or township. Now, that city, village, or township is part of a bigger system called a county, at least here in North America. So states are broken into counties, and counties are part of a bigger system called a state. States are part of a bigger system called a country. Countries are part of a bigger system called a continent. And lastly, continents are part of a bigger piece called a hemisphere. And of course, all the hemispheres together together give us planet Earth. So that is your global address, and it works in the same way that the taxa work in order to pinpoint a particular species, a particular type of organism. Each level is part of a bigger system. Each level is nested in a level above it. Here's another example of a plant. So this particular plant is called a Virginia creeper. Its scientific name is Parthenocissus kinkafolia. So the first choice we need to do in the taxonomic scheme of this particular organism is to determine is it a bacterium, is it an archaebacteria, or is it a eukaryote? And this is a eukaryote, so it goes into the domain eukarya. Again, we said there were three different kingdoms. We have fungi. We have plantae and we have animals. So this one, of course, would be part of the plantae kingdom. Now, in the plantae kingdom, there's 12 phyla. This particular phylum, it would be found in, it's called an anthophyta. It's called an anthophyte. And anthophytes are broken into two different classes. There's monocots and eudicots. So the name is a little bit longer. Uh, Eudicotyledon, uh, which is talking about the seed leaves early in its um early in its life it, where it de derives nutrition from versus a monocot. If we break down the class, you can see there's a lot of different classes of eudicots. This one's class happens to be called Vitales. And Vitales has three different families that represent it. This one is called Vitaceae. Vitaceae has 12 different genus uh, in order to, uh, uh, that it breaks into, and this one here is Parthenocissus, like we saw in the first part of its scientific name. Parthenocissus probably has a number of subdivisions that really zero in on a particular species. So this one's specific epithet is Kinkafolia. This particular plant is often mistaken for poison ivy and the fact that it's vine-like and tends to wrap around um, other living plants and um, kind of strangle out the other plant uh, as it lives and develops. And it also has leaves that look very similar to poison ivy's leaves, except this is in clusters of five, poison ivy's in clusters of three. So why do this at all? Why do we need scientific names? Well, look at this picture right here. We have two clearly different looking flowers, but the common name of both of them is just a lily. So both these are lilies, but you can tell with your own eyes, these are very different from one another. So the one on the left is called Lilium canadense. The one on the right is called Lilium bulbiferum. So we can easily differentiate the two by using a scientific name. Let's do another exercise. What's the difference in these fish that you see on the bottom left? Jellyfish, crawfish, and silverfish. Think about that for a second. If we take a look at a picture of each one of them, we can see jellyfish, many of us have seen these before, what a crawfish looks like, and what a silverfish look like. How fish-like are they? Well, of course, these aren't fish at all, but in their common names, how most people refer to them, that's all we go by, jellyfish, crawfish, and silverfish. And none of them are actually fish at all. If we look at the middle one as a further example, a crawfish, this particular animal, depending on where you're from, has different identities as well. Some people call it a crayfish. Some call it a crawdad. 
freshwater lobster, even a mud bug. So it has multiple different identities, which are all trying to really refer to the same animal. So what we can say is that common names vary both locally and globally. Languages vary. Every country may have their own way of saying a particular animal's name. But ultimately, if we use the system, the two-part name, going back to the Latin language, which doesn't change anymore, it's not used very often, but in biology we clearly use it, and therefore we can have this universal name that everyone agrees upon. And we don't have to worry about local and global takes on those names. It's very similar to the use of the metric system. Before the metric system came to be, different countries would have different ways of really representing weights and measures. And it would be hard to discern um, how much of one thing is equal to another thing because everyone is using a different system. When the metric system came to be that was based on the number 10, everyone could agree it means exactly the same thing no matter what country you're from, no matter what language you speak. Because ultimately, it came down to mathematics and using the power of 10 allowed it to be a system that most people could grasp fairly easily. So biologists can have a little bit of fun with taxonomy because if they're the founder of a particular organism that hasn't been found before, guess what? They get to name it. But, of course, Latin has to be there in its name, so there are some rules. Also, there are two overseeing organizations that really kind of watch and make sure that names are appropriate. But, um, as you can see, uh, if you take a look at some of these examples, you see their scientific names followed by what they actually are. So, if you take a look and uh, go down the list, you find some really interesting names that uh, look like somebody was having some fun as they came up with it. Now, as fun as those names are, they have to essentially adhere to rules from the ICZN and the ICBN, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature and the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature for Plants. And one of the overarching set of principles is that authors should exercise reasonable care and consideration of forming new names to ensure that they are chosen with their subsequent users in mind and that, as far as possible, they are appropriate compact, euphonious, memorable, and do not cause offense. So as you can see, this list here, I don't think they're going to cause offense to many people. Um, they are memorable. Euphonious is kind of a, a fun word to, uh, to kind of... Euphonious has a little bit of a gray area in the fact that it, uh, is, it sounds pleasant to the ear. And uh, compact, I mean... So you don't go overboard with the name. So let's take a look at some things that are out there um, that actually have these unique scientific names. This unique animal right here is called the pink fairy armadillo, but its scientific name is Clemphorus truncatus. This fun looking creature here, this is called an eye eye, or scientifically Daubentonia madagascarensis. Here's a fun one. Wow, look at the length on those legs of that wolf. This is called the main wolf, and I'm not even going to try to say that name. This one here, this is a fun one. This is called the Dumbo Octopus, or using a scientific name, it's Grimpo Toothus Inominata. The small jellyhead. Small jellyhead butt is how that actually translates. And one of my favorites here, this is the bird of paradise or Parochio Salfalata. Now, we mentioned earlier that classification takes all common characteristics and it puts animals and organisms in those groups together. And it's intended to reflect the evolutionary history when it's placed in that group, but it doesn't do it very well. There's another branch of biology called systematics that result, uh, relies on fossil data, comparative anatomy, development and molecular data to determine evolutionary history and relationships. And these things are known as the phylogeny, the evolutionary history and relationship of one organism to another. Let's take a look at fossil record data to start. Here you can see a lot of different species that eventually developed into modern day humans. And most of these species here clearly have gone extinct over time, but 
taken as what you see here, it's just basically a whole bunch of different species. What we want to do by looking at the fossil record is we want to see where our species came from. Was there a prior species that we were connected to or perhaps a species that went its own direction that was different? We want to eventually find out how our species came to be through progression of changes through the different skulls that we see in this, in this particular diagram. We can also look at comparative anatomy and development. For example, very closely related mammals such as horse, sheep, pig, dog, and human all have three bone structures that make up our upper arms a humerus, a radius, and an ulna, and you can see those same three bones in each of these species. Well, all five of these species here are going to be considered mammals, and we're going to be very different in the upper appendages that we have versus other groups of animals, which would mean that they're further or more distantly related than dogs, pigs, sheep, and horses are to ourselves. We also can look at molecular data. We can look at chromosomes themselves or get into the chromosomes and we can look at the DNA that allows us to differentiate one group or set of groups from one another. For example, if we take a look at this data here, this would be a segment of DNA from eight different species A through H. Now, if you come down here to this fork diagram, you can see that species A and B are now on the bottom and they set they, they appear to be set apart from species C through H. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, let's go to position number two, because that's the first mark that we see. And in species A and B, position two has two Cs, where the rest of the species from C through H have As. So clearly, that was the beginning of separating species A and B from the rest because of that difference. If we take a look at the other species, three through H, we can see there's another fork at one and three that differ from CD versus species E through H. So for CD, let's go to position one, and we can see they have Gs here, where the rest of the species E through H have Cs. So they go in their own direction. They're most more closely related to each other than they are to species E, F, G, and H. At position number three for them, you can notice they all have Ts, whereas, whoops, sorry, whereas the species C and D have Cs there. And then you can further subdivide later with other changes that come a little bit later at positions five and six in the DNA. The more A's, T's, C's, and G's that match, typically the closer related those species are to one another. Once we have a bit of information that helps us piece together how a particular species came to be, we can go ahead and represent it using a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. This is a diagram indicating lines of descent from a common ancestor. Now, this particular diagram that we see does not mean that this is the entirety of species that came to be or that a bear and a chimpanzee are extremely closely related. But what it does mean is that today's bear and chimpanzee shared a long time ago a common mammal ancestor. If we took another group in, lizards with bears and chimpanzees, a long time ago, at some point, there was a common ancestor that eventually led to both, or I should say all three different lines of descent based on some particular ancestor in the past. If we add an amphibian to the list, eventually we're going to be able to trace back where all four of these species had a common ancestor, and later on through evolution, different lines of descent started producing different traits, which led them on their own path to where they are today. Each branching point from a divergence is, uh, sorry, each branching point is a, is a divergence from its common ancestor, which we can see right here at these dots, and we call those dots nodes. So at this node here, there was a common ancestor that led to the bear in a different uh, direction for the chimpanzee. Further back, a common ancestor at this node for the lizard group, the bear group, and the chimpanzee, and on and on. Two types of characters used to construct a phylogenetic tree. First is called common characters, and these are present in all members of a group and in the common ancestor. So if we look at 
all of these animals here, lancelet, lamprey, tuna, salamander, turtle, and leopard, you notice that they all have a notochord. They all have essentially something running down their back that carries nerve impulses from whatever brain they have to the rest of their body. All of them share that. But as you go further, we then start to see derived characters, which are present in some members of the group, but absent in the common ancestor. These traits were not seen previously. So the lancelet was the only one here that kind of was fine with a notochord and nothing else, whereas all the animals on this side here, the lamprey, tuna, salamander, turtle, and leopard, all developed a vertebral column a long time ago. As you move forward on this phylogenetic tree, new derived characteristics are going to separate groups of animals from one another. For example, a lamprey has a vertebral column, but it doesn't have a hinged jaw, which means that this fork went this way away from the rest of the animals. Hinged jaws, though, are present in the tuna, the salamander, the turtle, and the leopard. Uh, the tuna is the only animal for, uh, with the ones that are remaining here that doesn't have four walking legs, so it has its own little part of the fork right there. Salamanders, turtles, and leopards do. An amniotic egg separates salamanders from turtles. Hair separates turtles from leopards. So essentially what we can do is we can take a look at what common characteristics they have and how they differed from other groups with derived characteristics that came to be at a later time. When figuring out evolutionary relationships, it's useful to know in which clade a shared derived character first appeared. So a clade is going to be a group consisting of a common ancestor and all of its descendants. Let's say we wanted to study a clade of a turtle versus a leopard. We might be interested to see when the two of these had a common ancestor that led to both of their development over time. So what was this common ancestor who had the ability to produce an amniotic egg and when was it alive? We could make another clade that compared salamanders, turtles, and leopards to one another. And if we did that, we would go ahead and make this fork structure a little bit bigger. And we would want to be, we would be interested in knowing when did four walking legs arrive in the common ancestor of a salamander, turtle, and leopard. This would be the clade that we were studying. Here's another clade with five different animals. One thing that we can say as we look at one of these fork diagrams here is that most closely related organisms share an immediate common ancestor. So in this case here, the Canis latrans and Canis lupus, the red wolf and the gray wolf, are called sister taxa, and their common ancestor will be found right here at this node between them. We can also see that closely related to them at some point were the badger family and the otter or weasel family right here in the Mustilidae group. And you can see that they seem to have some kind of common ancestor with dogs, whereas felines or felidae family went their own special direction here um, that was different. So we could say that the weasel family or mastilidae is closer related to canidae than cats are. So there is quite a bit of difference between the two. All the species in this clade that we're looking at are rooted, though, in this common shared attribute here of carnivora, order carnivora. They're all meat eaters. So the species that led to these five different groups of animals, the most common ancestor of all those species would be found right here at this branch line. We're going to update some past knowledge um, into new knowledge today um, because a lot of the books that we use are outdated. But um, Many older books have the five kingdom system of biology as kind of like the overarching theme of how things are divided. But as technology and science changes, we embrace that change and we accept new knowledge as it comes to us. So one of the things that we figured out was through the use of molecular data that instead of five kingdoms, there are three domains that everything is going to fall under at this time. Remember a long time ago when Aristotle was classifying things, there were just two kingdoms, plants and animals, that everything fell into. But as information progressed, 
we were able to add to that and continue even till today trying to figure out where things should be placed in our classification systems. So um, the five kingdoms, as you can see from the past, Monera, Protista, Plantae, Fungi, and Animalia um, have kind of changed into the three domain system. And what we look at um, at this point is big characteristics like what types of cells make up these organisms, what do those cells do, where do they live, and their DNA and RNA, how similar is it to one another? Um, that would place you in the three particular domains. The kingdoms itself, as we said, um, there's just going to be three now, plantae, fungi, and animalia. Monera and Protista, these are bacteria and these are protists. Um, the bacteria are in their own domain, but these protists are going to be sprinkled throughout plantae, fungi, and animalia at this point. Why do we put things in a particular kingdom type of cell? Is it prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Is it complex? Is it unicellular? Does it lead a unicellular life or is it multicellular? And what is its mode of nutrition? How does it um, ingest nutrients? So as we said, taxonomy will change with time and research. The top taxon now is domain-based. Uh, we have bacteria and we have archaea that make up what are known as the prokaryotes, the bacteria-like species. And we have eukarya that have all eukaryotic organisms underneath that label. The three multicellular kingdoms we just mentioned are fungi, plants, and animals. Unfortunately, protists... Um, they kind of lost their kingdomship and they got dropped into fungi, plantae, and animalia based on their modes of nutrition and their DNA and RNA compositions. As early as the 1970s, um, the idea of having domains that contain all of the subgroups came from a lot of RNA and DNA research. And that is ultimately the prominent idea today on how we're going to classify organisms. That three domain system leads to essentially partitioning each species that we know into one of these groups based on the characteristics that they show. So for example, if you find yourself in domain bacteria, you are a prokaryotic cell. That means you have no nuclear membrane, no membranous organelles. You basically have your nuclear material. Um, in cytoplasm, you have ribosomes, you have a cell membrane and you're very simple compared to the other two domains. You're unicellular, you live on your own, you have the, a solitary existence, however you might be uh, with others in colonies and you might communicate with those. They reproduce asexually, they basically grow and divide, grow and divide. Many are heterotrophic, so they derive nutrition from others, and some are photosynthetic, so they use the sunlight to help them convert um, essentially carbon, um, into nutritive molecules. Domain archaea, these are also prokaryotic, again unicellular, again asexual reproducers. They do have cell walls um, and their membranes have some branched lipids that we don't see as much of in the domain bacteria, highly branched, and they live in some very peculiar places. We'll call those extreme habitats. Um, they could leave, live in very salty conditions, oxygenless conditions, um, very hot, toxic conditions at the bottom of the ocean. So that's where that subgroup um, would live out all of its days. So they're rather unique in the fact that we find them in those strange places. Domain eukarya is everything else, things we're most familiar with. Unicellular or multicellular organisms. They have membrane-bound nucleus, which essentially holds in all the DNA and chromosomal material. Sexual reproduction is very common in eukaryotes. Um, contains the three kingdoms like we talked about, fungi, plantae, and animalia. And again, the protists are currently being subdivided into those three kingdoms. Here's another couple of graphics um, showing our phylogenetic relationships um, in this top one here, this phylogenetic tree on uh, the three domains. The bacteria went in this direction. Archaea went in this direction sometime later, and the eukarya, they're up here, and we're up here at the end somewhere. And you can see there's a lot of different species and branches of species that have occurred along the way. 
Here is a table showing some major characteristic distinctions between those three domains of life. Um, you can see here's the bacteria, here's the archaea, and here is the eukarya. Take a look at these and see how these three different branches of life differ from one another. Um, unicellular bacteria and archaea, definitely. Eukarya, there are some, but most are going to be multicellular organisms. Membrane lipids, phospholipids, uh, we have those as well as bacteria. And the, as we mentioned before, the archaea have multiple branches on theirs. Cell walls, bacteria have cell walls, archaea do as well. Eukarya, uh, our plants do and our fungi do, but um, animals do not. Nuclear envelopes is a no for both bacteria and archaea where we have that nuclear membrane. Membrane and bump organ organelles, same thing. No, no, and yes for us. Uh, ribosomes, all three, these are your protein producers, so you're going to need that in all forms of life. And introns, these are little tiny segments of DNA that get cut out, whereas the DNA that gets expressed by those ribosomes um, come from something called exons. Bacteria, everything gets expressed. They have no introns. Archaea have some, and we have a lot of DNA that gets cut out before what we have expressed goes through a ribosome to produce working proteins. So to finish up today's talk, make sure you look over your learning targets. Um, try to think back to the part in the lecture where we talked about those specific things. And through a combination of both your book and lecture, see if you can write out and show that you're able to do those things that the learning targets describe. Can you summarize the basic history of classification from really early to today? Can you explain what a scientific name is and why it's important? Can you describe the organization of tax in a biological classification? Uh, very specific to very general or vice versa? Can you describe how evolutionary relationships are determined from different groups? And can you compare and contrast the three domains of life? How are they similar and how are they different? Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.